Welcome everybody and thank you for joining Philadelphia Magazine's Think Fest 2021. I'm Queen Muse and I'm excited to have you here for my session, Resilience, Resolve and the Power of Community, Lessons from the Pandemic, where we'll be talking with Dr. Ayla Stanford, founder and CEO of the Black Doctors Consortium. She'll be telling us a lot about what she's been doing around uh, vaccination and testing uh, in the city of Philadelphia for the COVID-19 pandemic. But first, I wanna thank our sponsors for this event, Bank of America, Penn Medicine, St. Joseph's University, Western Governors University, and GoPuff. Very grateful to have their support. Please remember to join us for these conversations all week long at noon and 4 p.m. daily. And if you miss any of these sessions, we invite you to check out the recordings at phillymag.com slash thinkfest. So we are so excited for this discussion with Dr. Ayla Stanford. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, anybody who has a TV, a, you know, walked into a store, picked up a magazine, they're, they're probably seeing you everywhere right now. Um, and for good reason, you're doing so much work. And we want to talk about some of the things you have going on. I think a good starting place, though, is to talk about who you were before all of this started, right? Who was Alice Stanford before you know, all of the glitz and glamour and everything that has come from the work that you've been doing in the community. So I am a wife and a mom. And my day was something like uh, taking my kids to school or hurrying them out to get to the bus so they didn't miss the bus. And then going to my office to see patients, scheduling them for surgery. Um, after work, um, picking kids up, either starting homework or driving them to gymnastics or swim practice or track practice or basketball or soccer, one of those, depending on the time of year. Um, and then once they went to bed, having some quiet time with my husband. So that was, that was it. Vacation sometimes, Martha's Vineyard, um, just not people stopping you in Wawa to take your picture. None of that was happening. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and then your whole world changed, right? Well, everyone's world changed. COVID right. arrived. And let's talk about kind of what prompted you to change that day to day, right? You were already um, working in your practice. You were already serving folks and also doing really special, amazing work for celebrity folks and all sorts of stuff in the health space. But what prompted you to start your caravan for COVID testing? I, I mean, you're right. I was very comfortable, sheltered in place with an extra refrigerator, an extra freezer, you know, more toilet paper than we knew what to deal with. I mean, we were good. We are very good and comfortable in our pajamas. And when I started watching the news and reading the newspapers and seeing African-Americans, um, dying and no one was really saying it then it was more like cnn would show all the deaths of the people who had passed away and there was a, a easel easily recognizable trend of people of color and at the same time people would call me and say ayla i went to the er and they turned me away you know um i don't know what to do and i spent lots of time calling ERs and saying, you just turned someone away. I think they have COVID. They need a test. Oh, no worries. Dr. Stanford will get on it right away. And after doing that day after day, it's like, you know, this isn't right, you know? And then that coupled with hearing about the deaths uh, and everyone was saying it's because African-Americans are sicker people in general. And I'm like, no, nah, that's not it. You know, I'm talking to educated health insurance, you know, folks who are being turned away from some of our best hospitals in the city and the nation for pick a reason. And I said, um, I can't just sit back and watch someone lose their life if I could do something about it by offering a test. And at the time, that's all we had was testing and contact tracing. And so that's when I sprung into action, so to speak. Yeah. And, and talk to me a little bit about how you pulled that effort together. Um, just as one person who decided they were gonna get up and, and make testing available to folks, particularly in the black community. 
Yeah, I mean, I just uh, decided that no was not an option and it was unacceptable. And I heard lots and lots and lots of news. Um, and I realized that most of the things I needed to get started, I didn't need someone's permission um, and I didn't need anyone's supplies to do it. I already had my practice. I was already in network with the insurance companies. I had access to the testing kits and I knew where the people were. I knew where they were. Um, all of this was on the city dash page. You could see where the positivity rates were the highest. You could look at the zip codes um, and not that there weren't hospitals and urgent cares in those communities, but they were being turned away. And that's where we set up shop. Um, and I just, you know, it's funny to sort of walk down uh, memory lane because I just, there was a lot of shade thrown in my direction, okay? Um, but I just decided that I could do something about it because uh, it didn't seem that complex to me. COVID, yes, but what you could do to prevent it, what you could do to stop the spread, um, those were things I could do something about, and I wasn't going to wait until more funding came or until an RFP was released. It needed to happen like immediately. Yeah, and you sprung right into action. It sounds like healthy curiosity and just really a go get them type spirit. Um, as things kind of progressed in the pandemic, we saw the availability of vaccines and we saw your effort transition from offering testing to now offering vaccination. How did you ramp up that effort and how did you avoid pitfalls as you kind of transition to scaling and doing this on a bigger scale? I mean, everybody has pitfalls, but it's more, you know, what did you learn from it and how do you prevent it from happening again? So that's one. The other is that the core group of people that were with me, honestly, since March of 2020, many of them are still here. Like we've been in this day in and day out. And when you talk to some of the um, healthcare systems, they'll tell you that their turnover rate has been horrible and the attrition has been a problem. And a lot of that has to do with morale or lack thereof. Um, the uh, the vision or lack of vision, like why are we doing this? What is the purpose? When is it going to end? How are we integral to the solution of what's happening? You know, and do these folks that pay me, do they really care about my health and well being? And I can tell you, all those questions for us were yes, we do care, and we are a family. Um, and so, how we didn't have you know lots of errors and lots of problems is. We know each other, you know, we've been to, I mean, through some of the toughest, toughest times. And how do we pivot from testing to vaccination? I know my team. I know where people's strengths are. I know what their challenges are. And uh, we just put it together. Um, and so we literally found out on Wednesday, we would be vaccinating. And on Saturday, we were doing 500 people a day. That's how quickly it happened. And uh, we made it work because I only ever had licensed credentialed nurses, EMTs, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and doctors. It wasn't, well, who's trained to do it? Because all my folks were trained to do it. You weren't allowed to, you know, be a student or be someone in training and not be licensed to carry out a medical procedure, but then come here and all of a sudden now you were minted and you could do it. We didn't, we didn't do that. There was no subpar service being offered over here in the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium. And so that's how we were able to, um, to switch. Yeah, and, and it's been amazing just seeing the response to your effort because alongside all of that positivity, we've seen lots of frustration, confusion, um, folks in a community who just don't agree with vaccination. And that, that community existed long before COVID arrived, right? Um, but what are your thoughts on why so many people are resistant to getting the COVID vaccine in particular? I mean, you know, I sort of seesaw or sat or saddle two worlds, if you will, straddle two worlds. So I'm here and I'm in North Philly but I live in Montgomery County. And so I was just at a school board meeting last night 
where I was hearing parents tell me that they didn't want their kids to get vaccinated, right? And then in North Philly, people had reasons too, but they're totally different depending on the population. But I think one thing that's key is that you have to listen to what the reasons are. You can't start talking and educating and even preaching about why it's important till you listen, because for everyone, it's different, right? Um, and just cultural reasons, you know, in the African American community, because of lived experiences and atrocities in our history, there's tons of reasons why uh, folks don't trust the healthcare system. The healthcare system has been untrustworthy. And so, you know, it's not like people woke up one day and said, you know, I think I'm not going to trust my doctor just because no reason. No, it was because, you know, bad things happened, right? Um, without our consent, you know, without any empathy, where people who were sworn to first do no harm were doing harm to African Americans in the United States. And that, even if you didn't experience personally, that's something that gets passed down and passed down from generation to generation. And so that was a big reason, hands down, in the Black community. In other communities, it was more, this is my right, my choice, and you can't tell me what to do. And what I say to folks is, this is a public health crisis. That, there's no individuality in that. That means that what one person does affects the next person and the next person and the next person. So this isn't a situation where you get to stand up and say, my choice, my body, my right. Well, your choice impacts 10 other people. And just getting folks to recognize and understand that when they're so headstrong that we're taking something away. No, vaccination gives you something back and that's your freedom and that's your new normal and that's the ability to travel about and go as you please without worrying about if you get COVID, will you die? I mean, that's really what, what we're faced with. So I think, um, you know, with the African-American community that the untrustworthiness of the healthcare system, that's some, not something that gets switched off and on overnight. But then I had to share it with them, you know, there are more people who don't look like you that are lining up to get this vaccine and lining up to get the booster shot. And meanwhile, you're saying, no, I'm not gonna take it. But people, more people who look like you are the ones who are dying and then refusing the vaccine. And so just, and it takes more than one conversation. It's the other thing, you know? You have to be committed. And if it takes you 12 months, but at the 13th month, you come and get vaccinated, I don't even ask why. I'm just like, okay. And then it happens, right? So it's different. You got to listen um, and talk to folks. Yeah. So it sounds like listening is important. It sounds like consistency and messaging is important. What are some other things that you would say um, public health officials could be doing better to educate folks and encourage them to get vaccinated? Um, it's unpopular, but the mandates did uh, encourage people to get vaccinated because especially if you didn't have another marketable skill to employ your family. I mean, that's just the reality is employ, excuse me, take care of your family. Um, that was just the reality of the situation. Like if you were doing one job and you couldn't, I mean, and that's the other thing. A lot of people are like, what? I'm not getting it for my job. Forget that. I'll quit. But where else are you going to work? And unless you're just independently wealthy, you can't function without a job. So the mandates worked. Um, I think uh, the trust is important. It's the most time consuming, but the education coupled with the trust, trusted messengers going to the people, all those things matter because it shows that you took the extra effort to care for them. You know, just sort of saying, listen, we're open 24 hours a day. We have the vaccine. You can come get it. That's, that's not going to work. You know, you have to put some effort in 
if you really want that and build those relationships. So now as we're vaccinating and we open the Center for Health Equity, folks are like, oh, and can you also be my primary care doctor? And can I come back here to get my blood drawn to check my HbA1c for diabetes? And we can say, yes, we can. It's not just about vaccinating you. And that feels good to be able to be part of, you know, improving health outcomes in these communities. Yeah, and that's a perfect transition. I was going to, first of all, say congratulations. Um, we heard this is big news that you have a health equity center opening. Can you tell everybody more about this center, how this came about, um, and what we can expect to see from the center? So how it came about is with doing, you know, thousand vaccinations a day. <laughs> uh, folks sometimes will wait in line and come up to us and then get there and say, can you check this lump on my neck? They're like, okay, well, don't you wanna get vaccinated? No, I already got vaccinated, but can you check this lump? Or I got these labs from my doc. Um, can you tell me what it means? I don't understand. Or they're suggesting I should get surgery for my diverticulitis, but I really don't have pain anymore. Do you think I should still get surgery? And they were questions I could answer, but that wasn't the capacity with which we were there. And um, I was so ready to go back to the life I described to you in the beginning. And um, I was like, we can't leave. We can't leave. Um, the community has come to rely on us. And as I may have mentioned prior to your recording, like everybody's here, there's people who are of Asian descent, speaking languages I don't understand. There are uh, clearly white folks that don't live around here, here. There are black people that walked from the projects home here. <laughs> like everyone's here. And that to me is a testament to uh, the trust that we've earned, not just in communities of color, but everyone. Um, is here. And so how it came about is the community said they needed it and we answered the call. Um, how we actually funded it and built it, all the donations from GoFundMe and from people giving $5, $10, my personal uh, contributions, uh, some corporations that wrote us, you know, larger checks, maybe five figure or six figure checks, we reinvested that back into the community. So rather than saying, okay, this was a great thing, it lasted for a year, now we're gonna you know, do other things and everyone's gonna go back to, the, to their work, we put all that money back into the community. And so that's how we're here. How we stay sustainable, however, is with city dollars, state funding and federal funding. Um, and that's how the health centers exist. That's how Temple and Einstein exist because you know, largely those communities don't have um, lots of wealth. And if they have insurance, the reimbursement rates are very low, right? So you can't stay afloat just based on the number of patients you see. That support has to come from city, state, and federal um, funding. And so that's what we're working on now because I want this center to outlive me. Um, and we need that, that financial support. The services, newborn babies, through our senior citizens, everybody in between, uh, blood draws, urinalysis, EKGs, physical exams. Right now we have a partnership with a mammography unit um, that we'll have in the parking lot. We're raising money for an x-ray suite. Um, and of course, vaccines. Oh, we had flu shot. Now we've got flu shots. We've got baby COVID vaccines, grown COVID vaccines, so much. So it's, um, those are our services for right now as of today, but there will be more, I would presume. Oh my gosh, and behavioral health. Yes, we have a whole behavioral health, uh, mental health suite. We have a licensed psychologist. We also have some telemedicine folks for um, psychiatric and emotional uh, well-being because it's something that's not discussed a lot in our communities and people can't find culturally competent uh, providers. And so we have that here. And so that's something I'm very proud of as well. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. And the Long answer. Couldn't be better. I apologize. <laughs> no, that was good. I mean, the timing okay. couldn't be better for those types mm -hmm. of services. We're in a pandemic. Folks are more mm -hmm. stressed than ever, right? So it's great to have such a great resource right in the community. Um, I always, I always chuckle at um, how the first time we talked, you casually name dropped one of Philly's own awesome, <laughs> awesome people and um, some of the work that you've done with him. So Will Smith, uh, could you tell us kind of your affiliation with Will Smith, how you've worked with him uh, on his health journey in the past and how you're working with him in the future? So Will and I, through a mutual mentor, um, met. I mean, that's the best way to describe it. You know, people are always like, well, how'd you meet? How'd you get that job and so forth? Um, and I've been his doctor now for almost a decade. And uh, it's my job to keep him safe and healthy. And as he traverses all around the globe, that he still gets his preventative care, he gets his maintenance checkups, he gets the things that he should get for his age group um, at different times in his life. And it's been a true pleasure to do that. Um, but I also realized that some of the things that he faces with probably, you know, an income more than any of us will ever see are not that different from other Black men. It's really not that different. Um, and so the care he gets is the care that I give to others. It's just like here in the center, if you have no insurance or you have platinum gold, pick a plan, you're getting the same care. So we're not, you know, dis discriminating for lack of a better word um, on that. Um, other things with Will have been, you know, taking care of family members. You know, his heart is, is so big and he's so generous to friends of friends that need, you know, expert opinions, you know, finding the best person in the city and the world to help them through a particular condition I've helped him with. And then his projects, you know, he needed his colonoscopy. So we arrange that. Uh, when he ran the marathon in Cuba, he needed to have an exercise stress test. So we, you know, worked on that together. Um, when he turned 50 and he wanted to do something phenomenal and spectacular, he hella bungee jumped out of a helicopter into the Grand Canyon. And I was the uh, trauma director and first aid person on set with him for that. And uh, then with COVID, goodness, every uh, sort of production needs a COVID lead or a COVID head. So it just made sense that I would be the person for the job and my company. And so now as he has his book tour uh, with his new book or first book, I shouldn't say his first book, his first memoir or only um, coming out November 8th, is that we will be handling the COVID protocols. I'll be leading up the uh, COVID protocols for him over this five city uh, tour. So excited about that too. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it's been awesome. a diversified repertoire for medicine for me. I'm not complaining at all. It's, it's yes. good stuff. Mm -hmm. That's incredible work. I mean, just to think like you're running the clinic and then you're off here helping Will Smith bungee jump out of a helicopter. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Anyone going to the book tour, you know it will be safe. You yes. First. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're we're in an interesting space, right? We have multiple vaccines available now, and um, those vaccines are now, you know, just as of this week, available for younger children. Um, how do you see us coming out of this? There are lots of folks who are feeling like we're we're in the long haul, right? It's it's yeah. been almost two years. Um, Folks are exhausted. What does what does it look like for us to come out of the pandemic, um, and how does it happen? I mean, the more people are vaccinated, is how it happens. I mean, long and short, kid, old, everybody in between, right? Sometimes it makes me mad because if all the adults had gotten vaccinated, we wouldn't even need it for our kids. How about that? Right? Unlikely because the amount of virus in the community would have been so minuscule that the chances of them getting it would have been low. And if they got it and they went to spread it back to an adult, an adult wouldn't get it because we were all vaccinated, right? But unfortunately that didn't happen. So 
The plus is now we have this vaccine that's safe for our five to 11 year olds already approved for our 12 and up. Um, and so it's a step in the right direction to getting us back to our new normal. And so I would encourage the parents who are saying, no way, no how will I vaccinate my child um, to talk to your doc, you know, to talk to trusted messengers. Uh, be careful that you're getting your information from people who know and not just people who got a new claim to fame during the midst of the pandemic, you know, sort of spouting off things that are unfounded, um, but a reputable source. Uh, it's how our schools stay open, how the kids can participate in sports activities, how families can take vacation. Um, you know, it's how we get back to our new normal. It's how maybe I could walk down the street without wearing a mask, um, which I'd like to get back to, but I'm also open to the fact that that might not happen. I don't know. So um, I'm encouraged, excited. I plan to get my 11 year olds vaccinated on Saturday. Uh, they have a soccer game Saturday morning. So I figure in case they feel funky or their arm is a little sore or whichever, we'll do it after something that's important to them. And then I get to come home and be mommy and just watch them if they need anything. So that's my plan. My 13 year old is already vaccinated. He's been vaccinated since May. Um, but my 11 year olds, I'm looking forward to that on Saturday. Awesome, awesome. And I guess uh, my last question is just about what's next for you? I mean, oh lots of big irons in the fire already, but maybe what we could look to see from you and the consortium over the next few months? Oh, next few months is good. I thought you were gonna say next few years. Um, <laughs> next few months, we're gonna just keep, you know, perfecting, honestly, striving for excellence in our healthcare delivery. Um, uh, working with some of our uh, health, you know, entities are giants really about how we just do better um, in terms of delivering care, particularly to our most vulnerable and those who might need a safety net. Um, all about that. And, you know, so when folks invite me to be on panels, you know, I was invited to do a, a TED talk, uh, you know, just on NPR, medical school grand rounds, all of those things. And they're saying, well, how did you do it? Like, how can we do it? Um, I can't wait to talk about that because I won't be doing this forever. You know, I've got to train the next generation to come in here. So we won't just be, you know, a movement that worked during a moment of time, but that it lives beyond us. You know, that's the legacy building. And so for me, us getting this right, I mean, and really getting it right and then cloning it other places throughout the city. And nationally, that's what I look at um, for us, for legacy building, because um, we've got to change the narrative that the life expectancy for Black and Brown people is three years, five years, 10 years less than um, white Americans. We just, we need to do better. Yeah, yeah. And I guess since you mentioned it, we can talk long lens. What's the long view or the long ah. vision for, for Dr. Stanford? Oh, I, you know, I, I'm not opposed to uh, working in government, you know, at a certain uh, level. Um, not opposed to being on a speaking circuit and teaching. Uh, gotta stay mom, gotta stay wife. <laughs> and so I, I think about that, you know, I just, I've been 50 for not quite a year yet, so just uh, figuring out the next step, but I do believe it'll be in public health and that everything that I do has got to be for the next generation. Um, it's got to be that it can't, we can't go back to what life was like for people of color with their healthcare outcomes pre-COVID. Can't go back to that. And in my lifetime, if there's another emergency that we will be poised and ready to help folks that are most vulnerable. and. That I'm committed to, um, you know, without mentioning the magazine, because this is a magazine, but a national magazine put out that Philadelphia had the highest percentage of vaccinations of any other large city 
in the United States of over 500,000. Philadelphia had the greatest rate, over 50% of vaccinating African-Americans. And I'm gonna take full credit for that, full credit, <laughs> and my team, because we did the work. We did the work. Um, and the evidence has been shown. When people say I need uh, uh, evidence-based and scientific data, the data has shown that what we are doing works. And I'm just looking forward to the opportunity to do more of that throughout our city and honestly throughout the nation. So whatever stage allows that best is where you will see me standing. Awesome. And that is a great point for us to end. I really appreciate you <laughs> pausing your efforts of saving the world to come speak with us today. Um, and I thank all of you out there for joining us for this great conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Stanford.